Emotions are central to what it means to be human. So today, we're going to answer some key questions about emotions to learn more about them and their role in our lives. Before continuing on, if you're a therapist, coach, or wellness entrepreneur, be sure to grab our free ebook to get science-based resources that will help you grow your wellness business exponentially. You can get it now by clicking the ebook link in the description below. All right, let's get back to today's topic, emotion. What is emotion? Emotions are defined in various ways depending on who you ask. One might say that emotions are biological states that come about as a result of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Emotions may also exist on a continuum from pleasure to displeasure, but emotion theorists largely disagree on the exact definition of emotion. When we think about emotion, we often focus mostly on negative emotions, which are unpleasant or undesirable states. Even though we may not like negative emotions, they help us do important things in our lives. For example, fear can help us escape from a predator, anger can help us right injustices, and sadness can help us rest or seek social support. Positive emotions, on the other hand, are pleasant or desirable states. These are just as important as negative emotions. They can help us feel better, make stronger social connections, and even succeed in the world. Some common positive emotions include happiness, excitement, calmness, contentment, and love. How are emotions different from moods? Emotions differ from moods in that emotions typically last seconds to minutes, whereas moods can last hours to days. So if we say, I'm feeling down, that's likely referring to a mood. But if we say, I'm sad that Mark didn't show up to dinner tonight, we're likely referring to an emotion. Of course, emotions can contribute to moods, and moods can contribute to emotions, so there is some overlap. How are emotions different from thoughts? Thoughts and emotions are quite different things, but they overlap both in terms of experience and in the ways that we talk about them. For example, we can't experience an emotion like regret without thinking about something that we've done and judging it to be bad or wrong. Many emotions work this way. They would not exist if not for the thoughts that created them. Similarly, many of the words we use to describe our experiences are a mixture of thoughts and emotions. For example, words like brooding, resentful, or disturbed are combinations of thoughts and emotions. How are emotions different from feelings? We tend to use the word feeling interchangeably with the word emotion, even though feelings and emotions are not the same things. Feelings include both emotional experiences and physical sensations. For example, we might say that we're feeling hungry, feeling tired, or feeling itchy, even though these are not emotions. But we can also feel emotions. For example, we may feel upset, angry, or sad. All of these considerations make emotion a very complex thing to talk about and understand. So let's dive a little deeper to better understand what emotions are and how they affect us. What is emotion theory? There are a couple of key theories of emotion that help us understand what emotions are and how they relate to each other. We'll talk about these now. The discrete theory of emotion. The most well-known of these theories is the discrete theory of emotion. This theory suggests that emotions are separate, discrete things that we developed from having to deal with fundamental life tasks, like running away from a predator. According to the discrete theory of emotion, there are five to six basic emotions, and all other emotions are just varying shades or combinations of these. The basic emotions are enjoyment, sadness, fear, anger, disgust, and sometimes surprise. You can learn more about these emotions on our website by clicking the links to related resources in the description below. The circumplex model of emotion. Other emotion theorists have argued that emotions are not discrete things. They note that emotions don't have specific locations in the brain, and single emotions don't tend to occur without the presence of other emotions. These findings suggest that even though we use specific words to describe specific emotions, they may actually instead exist on a continuum. The emotion circumplex model suggests that emotions can be mapped on two continuums. One is from high to low energy, and one is from high to low pleasure. So an emotion like sadness would be low energy and low pleasure, while an emotion like anger would be high energy and low pleasure. This model also accounts for the fact that emotions are not always the same intensity. For example, we might feel a little scared, a lot of fear, or downright terrified. 
Now, the average person may not need to know these emotion theories, but we do need to understand our own emotions, what causes them, how we experience them, and how we regulate them. So let's dive into the practical knowledge we need to improve our emotional health. We'll start with emotional intelligence. What is emotional intelligence? One of the most well-known topics related to social and emotional health is emotional intelligence. This is a type of intelligence that is defined as the ability to monitor and regulate one's own and others' emotions, and to use emotions to facilitate one's thoughts and actions. Emotional intelligence is sometimes thought to include the following four parts. Emotion perception. As we go about our daily lives, we see other people, people who experience a range of emotions. Over time, we learn to detect these emotions from things like facial expressions, body language, tone of voice, and other cues. The better we are at perceiving emotions, the more likely we are to react in an appropriate way. For example, if we perceive that someone is sad, we're more likely to comfort them. And if we see that they're angry, we might be more likely to confront or avoid them. Emotion facilitation of thought. This involves the ability to use one's emotions to aid problem solving. This may involve listening to our emotions and using them as informative tools to help us navigate life. For example, if we're feeling angry about something but we don't use this emotion to take action, we're not likely to solve the problem, so it's likely to continue making us angry. Another example may be that we just said something that leads someone else to get hurt. First, we need to perceive this emotion in the other person, and then we can use the emotion to help us learn something about how our behavior affects other people. This is how emotion can aid problem solving and help us learn. Emotion understanding. This involves understanding the way that emotions change over time, their causes and consequences, and how they may blend together. This skill set includes emotional awareness, or recognizing that we are having an emotion. It includes emotional clarity, or knowing that we are feeling sadness rather than fear, for example. And it involves emotional granularity, or being able to distinguish between similar but distinct emotions. Overall, understanding our emotions can help us better navigate life. Emotion regulation. This involves the management of one's own and others' emotions. Emotion regulation may include all of the stages of changing an emotional experience. This often starts with attention. For example, do we pay attention to the things that make us happy? Or do we pay attention to the things that upset us? Emotion regulation can also involve choosing to put ourselves in situations that make us feel good and avoiding the ones that make us feel bad. We can also regulate our emotions with cognitive strategies like reappraisal, which involves looking for silver linings in difficult situations. You can learn even more about emotional intelligence on our website by clicking the relevant links in the description below. Now let's talk about emotion contagion. What is emotion contagion? Did you know that not all of our emotions are our own? It's true, we can actually catch other people's emotions. Emotional contagion, or the transfer of emotion between people, appears to occur easily, even in online situations. We feel bad when others feel bad, and good when others feel good. In other words, we tend to absorb other people's emotions. If we catch other people's emotions, and this is a problem for us, there are some things we can do. Some researchers suggest that we might alternate between moments of self-awareness and moments of other awareness. For example, if we're starting to feel anxious but can't identify any clear cause, we might try to turn on our emotion perception to see if we're catching anxiety from someone we're interacting with. We would then aim to focus more on being present in our body. How do we stay emotionally healthy? Ultimately, emotional health arises from positive health behaviors such as good sleep, a good diet, and regular exercise. We also must make an effort to regulate our emotions. Whether this means looking for the silver linings in challenging situations, practicing gratitude, or being present and mindful, finding ways to improve our emotional experience will ultimately improve our emotional health. To learn more about this topic and other topics related to well-being, check out our vast collection of resources at berkeleywellbeing.com.